Good evening and welcome to RESIA, the research seminar in Islamic art. Uh, thank you for coming, so numerous, and I'm very happy to have uh, uh, Mariam Rosserowen and uh, Anna McSweeney tonight uh, doing a double act. And uh, I will in briefly introduce them for those who may not uh, know them very well, and then I'll pass over uh, for the seminar. Um, remember to uh, write your um, questions or points in the chat, and I will uh, then read them out uh, aloud at the end of the presentation. So Mariam, Mariam Rosserowen, received her PhD from Oxford University, and the book based on her doctoral thesis has been recently published, Open Access by Brill in 2021, as Articulating the Hijaba, Cultural Patronage and Political Legitimacy in Al-Andalus, the Amirid Regency 970-1010 CE. She has been a curator uh, in the Middle Eastern section at the Vienna since 2002, and currently she is the lead investigator for the Vienna project Crafting Medieval Spain, the Torrijos Ceiling and the Global Museum, funded by a British Academy, Leverhulme's Small Project Grant, and in collaboration with Anna, Anna McSweeney and, and uh, Trinity College Dublin. The ceiling will be redisplayed at Vienna East uh, in 2025, and Mariam is also contributing to plans for its display and interpretation. And Anna McSweeney is an alumna of SOAS. She received her MA and PhD in Islamic art at SOAS, and she's now a lecturer in the Department of the History of Arts and Architecture at Trinity College Dublin where her teaching includes a module on the art of Islamic Spain and North Africa, and one on the arts of the book, uh, also used in the collection of the Chester Beatty Library. Her publications include a book on the Nasrid wooden ceiling from the Partal Palace, entitled From Granada to Berlin, the Alhambra Cupola, also recently published in 2020 by Verlag Kettler. Anna is a co-investigator of the Vinay Research Project I mentioned uh, before with Mariam. And today, uh, Anna and Mariam will talk to us on an interesting subject that has not received much attention so far, and it's the use of wood in Islamic interiors. Thank you, Anna and Mariam, and over to you now. Thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen uh, before we kick off. So we wanted to start by quoting a poem. This building, which embellishes the Alhambra, is home for the man of peace and of war. Fortress that guards a palace, fortress say, or also a happy meeting place. It is a palace whose splendor is shared by a ceiling floor and four rooms. Marvellous its stuccos and tiles, but even more prodigious the carpentry of its ceiling. After being assembled it was lifted precisely to its lofty position. Here, just as in poetry, there are paronyms, antitheses, circumlocutions and inner meanings. The tower shows us the face of Yusuf like a sign in which all the beauties reach their fulfilment. He is of the glorious Khazraj, whose works for the good of the faith are as bright as sunlight. So these verses were written by the Nasrid court poet Ibn al-Jayab and are written in plaster on the walls of the Alhambra's tower palace, the Torre de las Cautivas, or the Calahura, built by Yusuf I in 1349. This is the translation given by José Miguel Puerta Vilches in his book, uh, Reading the Alhambra. It celebrates its carpentry ceiling and even refers to how it was constructed by being prefabricated on the ground before being lifted precisely to its lofty position. Since the ceiling in the Torre de las Cautivas today dates from the 19th century, we're showing you another of the Alhambra's spectacular ceilings in the Palacio de Comares, constructed just a year later. For the last couple of years, um, and Anna for much longer, 
We've been studying this type of carpentry ceiling through the Crafting Medieval Spain project, um, which Anna mentioned in the introduction, which is funded by a British Academy and Leverhulme Trust small project grant. Our focus has been this ceiling in the V&A collection, which comes from the lost palace built after 1492 in the small town of Torrijos, just north of Toledo, by the noble couple Gutierrez de Cardenas and Teresa Enriquez, who were close courtiers of the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella. The V&A ceiling is one of four ceilings that survived from this palace, which was dismantled in the early decades of the 20th century. The ceilings are displayed in collections in Madrid, the Loire and San Francisco, and the V&A ceiling will soon be redisplayed at V&A East Storehouse. This is a render of what that might look like, uh, which is the new collections and research hub that the V&A is building in Stratford, East London, and which will open to the public in 2025. The ceiling has undergone conservation, and this has provided the opportunity to look closely at it for the first time in about 100 years, um, and to combine in our research project the different expertises required to study a ceiling like this in order to understand its construction, patronage and historical context, which we've done by assembling an international and interdisciplinary group of collaborators. We're not going to talk in more detail about the project here, as we recently spoke about it at the Islamic Art Circle, but please feel free to ask us more questions about it later. We're more interested in exploring with you this evening um, is where such a project might go next. The Torrijos ceilings are examples of a type of carpentry known in Spanish as Carpinteria de lo Blanco, meaning white carpentry, the white probably referring to the widespread use of pine wood, which appears whiter than other woods when freshly cut. In Spain, this technique flourished between the late 13th and 16th centuries and was used predominantly to make decorative ceilings that combined Islamic and Northern European styles and techniques. These wooden ceilings, many of which survive today, were made for religious and secular buildings in Muslim, Christian and Jewish contexts across Iberia. And you've got two examples here. They're often considered within the category of mudeja art, a terminology we've been careful to avoid. As you might know, the Spanish term mudeja has come to refer to Muslims on the peninsula who lived under Christian rule following the conquests of Islamic territory. In the 19th century, it was applied to art history and implied that any object made in an Islamic style must have been made by Muslims. More recently, terms such as Mudeja and Moorish have been rejected because they perpetuate an outdated idea that a particular race and religion were central to the design and patronage of these artworks. We do not know the religion of the craftsmen who made these ceilings, so calling them Mudeja or Moorish is at best misleading. Guild regulations from 16th century Granada note the requirement to elect both old and new Christians, i.e. converts, to the offices of the guild, which implies that there was a mix of cultural and confessional identities among the carpenters at this time. It is perhaps because these ceilings were made that a wide variety of buildings across religious and geographic boundaries that scholars have found them difficult to classify neither fully Islamic nor entirely Spanish, the ceilings tend to fall between the gaps in art historical discussions of the period. The Islamic origins of this carpentry technique were unquestioned for a long time. But more recently, the specialist who's made a career out of studying, restoring and even creating new ceilings in this technique has come to a different conclusion. This is architect Enrique Nuere, whose 2020 publication, The Carpentry That Interlaced With My Life, is a kind of memoir charting his career, discovering and working with strapwork carpentry ceilings in Spain. Leaving aside some of the problematic language he uses, for example, he constantly refers to, quotes, Islamic invaders, he argues that, quotes, these works were not made by mysterious Islamic artisans, but sprang from a deep-rooted woodworking technique that already existed in the peninsula long before the Alhambra or the Alcazar of Seville were conceived. He states that, quotes, such a sophisticated carpentry-based tradition 
could not emerge in Islamic territories where wooden gable roofs were and still are practically non-existent. He argues that the ancestors of this tradition of carpentry roofs were rafter pair roofing frames that quotes, must have been the habitual roofing in Visigothic Spain with Toledo as the epicenter of this technique. But one problem here is that we have no standing evidence of Visigothic examples. Another quote, um, there is no doubt whatsoever that this could only be done by carpenters already accustomed to the use of the framing set squares, but could never be achieved by a hypothetical carpenter from the East who had never made sloping wooden roofing frames in his country of origin. Though ironically, he elsewhere refers to the first roofing frames of the Karawiyin Mosque in Fez. Another quote, the factor that finally convinced me of the Northern European origin of this woodworking technique was the control of the entire process of roofing construction by the use of triangular templates in the form of set squares. He states that set squares are unknown in, Euro in Morocco where quotes this type of carpentry is still practiced and where they claim to have in, they claim to have inherited it from al andalus my emphasis <laughs> um, this question about the use of set squares or equivalent tools in islamic societies is certainly one that we would like to look into more deeply and would welcome your thoughts on this Nuere believes that the quotes new islamic masters lacked carpenters and that, quote, there were no skilled woodworkers from the East. Finally, his overriding argument is that Christian carpenters converted to Islam at the time of the Muslim conquests. And this is how the technique entered Islamic architecture, that it was an indigenous Hispanic technique practiced by the Visigoths, that, quote, the authors of these works did not come from the East, but were the heirs of a tradition originating in Toledo, or even came from Toledo itself. He believes the widespread use of this carpentry ceiling in the Alhambra is because, quotes, the Nasrid monarchs contracted the same carpenters who were supplying the nobility of Toledo or Seville to build the roofing of their palaces, i.e. that the carpenters were Christian. He does not explicitly say so in this book, but the fact that we have very comparable wooden carpentry ceilings in North African mosques is thus because the ceilings would have been made by Andalusi craftsmen another widespread historiographical assumption that should be addressed and corrected, and that these craftsmen were descended from Christian converts who brought these carpentry skills with them. I do not at all want to disparage Enrique Nuero's huge contribution to the technical understanding of these ceilings, and he is surely right that a tradition of roofing frames and set squares and a possible indigenous carpentry tradition based around Toledo is what helped this technique to become widespread in later centuries. But his discussion of Islamic architecture is laden with historiographical issues and outdated, outdated notions and assumptions. We have seen this as a provocation to dig deeper into the use of wood in Islamic architecture. And we've given interiors in our title rather than architecture because we want to include large scale furnishings like doors and furniture, like mihrabs, minbars, and cupboards, which feature very comparable decoration and also possibly construction methods to the ceilings and may have been made by the same craftsman. So we want to explore what a research project on wood in Islamic interiors would look like. And we're, we're really hoping to crowdsource your comments and feedback. Uh, so please don't hold back. So staying with the subject of wooden ceilings for now, it's important to open the question out to the North African context, but this has been beset by problems of access and documentation of the relevant buildings, as well as historiographical prejudices, as we've already touched on. But in recent years, great strides forward have been made through the work of Spanish scholars, and in particular Antonio Almagro, to document and revisit key monuments in present day Morocco. The most important of these for our discussion today is the Qutbiyah Mosque in Marrakesh. During the building's extension after 1163, four monumental wooden ceilings were incorporated um, into the roofing of the Qibla wall, alternating with plaster Mokarnas vaults. 
These ceilings were constructed in the simple technique of par in nudillo, or rafter and collar truss, that seems to characterize the earliest ceilings, but continues to be used alongside more complex ceilings with stellate decoration. Um, in two of the ceilings uh, on either side of the mihrab, the almisate, which is the flat central section, is constructed around large eight pointed stars. Very like the motif that becomes so widespread on Spanish ceilings, um, where it's called a rueda or a wheel. Um, it's seen all over the Torrijo ceiling, for example. Alfonso Jiménez Martín, who's written about these ceilings together with Almagro, has no doubt that they date from the time of the Kutubia's extension in 1163, which would make these ceilings some of the earliest surviving and datable examples. Jiménez also comments on the maturity of the technique used at Kutubia, um, i.e. that this was an architectural tradition already well developed by the 1160s. Um, the images we're showing you all come from the amazing resource Ataral, the Atlas of Almohad Architecture, led by Antonio Almagro, which we highly recommend. Um, and you can now also refer to the article, The Kutubia Mosque Revisited, published by um, Almagro and Alfonso Jimenez in the latest issue of Mocarnas. As they point out there, the wooden ceilings of the central nave, I'll just go back quickly to show you what I mean. So the, these ceilings here are probably much later, um, dating after the 17th century. And another example of wooden furnishing um, at the Kutubia Mosque was the retractable Maxura, which Almagro has also recently written about. And we'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. And of course, um, on, the, on the right, the famous Mimbar commissioned from Cordoban carpenters, which though created in a very different technique, featured designs in complex geometry. Another Almohad mosque with wooden ceilings is the Kasba Mosque, also in Marrakesh, founded by the Caliph Al-Mansur in 1185. Some of these ceilings seem to have affinities with those at the Kutubiya. And we're very grateful to Inigo Almela for sharing with us not only his knowledge of this building, but also his photographs of the ceilings. And we were very much hoping he was going to be here with us this evening, but unfortunately hasn't been able to. He's been detained, so hasn't been able to attend. However, um, in the current state of research, it's not possible to say whether these ceilings date from the 12th century or could be the result of later interventions uh, by the Sardians. Important evidence of the existence of wooden ceilings at the Almohad Mosque of Seville has recently been found in the form of two aliceres that were found in excavations in the mosque's former patio, um, sorry, in the former mosque's patio uh, in 2010 and 2016. The construction of this building dates to the 1170s, and eyewitness descriptions tell us that the greater part of the mosque's ceilings were made of wood. The prayer hall of this building covered nearly 12,000 metres squared. Um, anyone who's been to this to Seville Cathedral will be able to comprehend the vastness of this structure. Um, and most of this wood was probably brought from Morocco. Uh, Ali Therese are one of the many words in the study of these ceilings that it is impossible to translate into English. So I've included a little diagram which um, hopefully helps you understand um, where they are located on these kinds of ceilings. Um, the two aliferes were identified as being made from Penis sylvestris, more commonly known as Scots pine. Um, and the first to be found, which is this one over here, was dated, was radiocarbon dated with a 95% probability between the years 995 and 1155. So there can be no date that these Sevillan examples indicated the existence of wooden ceilings in the mosque that date to the Islamic period and likely followed a model of mosque roofing already established at the Kutubiya. Let us bear in mind that the earliest datable surviving ceiling of this kind on the Iberian Peninsula is that at the Cathedral um, of Teruel, which was created in 1261. 
There's a wider context of wooden ceilings in North Africa, but these have received very little attention and a closer study is needed before we can fully understand their relationship with Iberian ceilings. For example, the stellate ceiling um, of the Madrasa Alatarin in Fez, which dates to the 1320s and is comparable, though on a smaller scale, to the Comara ceiling at the Alhambra. And the ceiling of the Madrasa Bu'inaniya, also in Fez, dates to the 1350s. These madrasas are full of carved wood in different techniques and extensive wooden furnishings, all of which would repay further study. In the Nasrid context, the ceiling of the Cuarto Real de Santo Domingo in Granada has been dated to 1283, a date confirmed through dendrochronology. This is only two decades after the earliest surviving, quotes, Christian example, which has a much simpler Pari Nudio construction. The Granada ceiling seems to be the first surviving example with a fully developed eight-pointed star design. Noire also says that this is a very mature example and that, quotes, it is obvious that it had to be constructed by expert carpenters, whether Christians from Toledo or Cordoba, or others who had conserved the traditional techniques based on the use of set squares. So this is something else we might question. But the most spectacular example in the Alhambra is, of course, the Kubba, or domed hall of Sultan Yusuf I in the Palace of Comares from 1350, which would become the throne hall of the Catholic monarchs in 1492. Made from over 8,000 individually carved pieces of wood, its inscriptions indicate that it represented the celestial dome of the heavens. But it's important for us to open out this question beyond the Andalusi and Maghrebi context. Another famous wooden ceiling is that spectacular Mokarnas vault over the Capella Palatina in Palermo, which can be dated to the 1140s. And it's made from wood that um, would have been locally available in Sicily. Lev Kapitekin, in his Defil thesis, argued for separating the origins of the ceiling structure from the origins of its painted decoration. While the paintings have been firmly linked to the Fatimid realm, it is famously argued that a workshop, uh, sorry, and it is famously argued that a workshop of Fatimid painters came from Egypt to decorate the ceiling. Kapitekin has linked the construction of the Mukarnas and the technical details such as the ribbing of its tiny cupolas to a Maghrebi and Andalusi architectural tradition. He cites contemporary standing examples of Mokarna domes in the Almoravid and Al Mohad buildings, the Kubat al Baru in Marrakesh from 1117, the Great Mosque of Tlemcen, 1136, Al Karawiyin in Fez, 1134 to 43, Tinmal, 1153 to 4, and the Kutubiya whose Mokarnas vaults, as we have seen, date from the building's second phase in the 1160s and alternate with the wooden ceilings. There is also a palatial example of Mokarnas painted with scenes from the courtly cycle in the fragments of decoration of Ibn Mardanisha's palace in Murcia. He was the rebel king between 1147 and 1172 who held out against the Almohad takeover. And I'd like to mention here the, the recently published book by Abigail Krasner Balbale, The Wolf King, Ibn Mardanish and the Construction of Power in Al-Andalus. But all of these vaults are made from plaster, not wood, a problem that Capitakin does not attempt to resolve. He also highlights that the Capella Palatina ceiling is a unicum and cites other examples of architectural woodwork in Sicilian churches which are much closer to the Spanish ceilings we've been looking at. The most compelling extant example is the wooden roof of the cathedral at Chefalu. Uh, construction of the church was completed between 1131 and 1148 that continued into the 13th century. And I'm not sure myself of the accepted date of the Chefalu ceiling. And I'm hoping that there's somebody in the audience who might be able to clarify that. If it's from the mid 12th century, it is contemporary with the Almohad examples we discussed earlier and further supports the idea of an existing North African architectural tradition which was deployed in the Kutubiya and also influenced the construction of Norman churches. 
To my knowledge, the use of wooden ceilings in Sicilian and Spanish architecture has not been discussed in connection with each other, a point that Capitakin made in his 2013 article, The Daughter of Al-Andalus, and is the result of another disciplinary boundary that it's time to break down. Other examples of Sicilian architectural woodwork have been studied by Ariel Fine, um, and I'm hoping that she might be here today to tell us more about her studies and the discussion later. Working outwards still further, um, of course, we have very important examples of carpentry in Fatimid Egypt, not so much in ceilings or architectural elements, but in large scale items of furniture. In particular, the portable mihrabs made for the tombs of Saida Rukhaya, datable 1133, and Nafisa, datable 1154. The technique used here, as I understand it, is different from what we see in Spain. The geometric elements are created to interlock from behind without the use of glue or nails, a technique known today as kundakari, after the Ottoman word for this technique. According to architect Wa'al Sabri, who is working on a project to save this craft from disappearance today, this technique seems to have developed in both Egypt and Anatolia in the 12th century. And of course, from Mamluk Egypt, we have fabulous examples of carpentry in the fabrication of mimbars, such as these panels from the mimbar for the Ibn Taloun Mosque, um, made in 1296. So we're thinking about this in a Mediterranean context because our specialisms lie here. But we're obviously aware that there is a much wider subject here um, when we encompass the Eastern Islamic lands as well. While wood might have a relatively low status in art historical studies across disciplines, in lands where trees are scarce, it was obviously a status material. Indeed, some of the earliest examples of Islamic art are made from wood. We have ceiling beams from Samara, for example, and also the earliest phase of the Great Mosque of Cordoba. Though these structures seem to have been flat beams and the woodwork is a foundation for painted or carved decoration, rather than using carpentry to create something decorative in its own right. There is also one lovely comparison that we owe to Marcus Milwright. One of the scenes in the, painted in the vault of the audience hall of the mid eighth century Umayyad bathhouse, Kosaya Amra, shows sawyers using a technique to carve planks and beams from a tree trunk. A similar technique was observed in the 19th century by Jane de la Foy, in Susa and by Hans Wolf in Iran in the late 1930s. These sawyers were not necessarily making beams for building construction, but the presence of this scene in the vault of at Kosai Amra invites speculation that it was self-referencing its own construction, although the other painted scenes around it are drawn from late antique representations of labours. Going back to Enrique Nuere's assertion quoted above that there were no skilled woodworkers from the East, we think it is safe to say that there were. On the one hand, there is the use of wood, which is obviously widespread in Islamic architecture from its earliest examples. And on the other hand, there is the use of carpentry to make specific kinds of objects. And one question that we have is whether there is regional distinctiveness and variation in the carpentry techniques and as a correlative in the geometric techniques used. Is it valid to compare traditions of geometric carpentry in Al-Andalus and Egypt if the techniques used are totally different? Is there something in the geometry itself that is regionally distinctive? I'm not an architect or a carpenter, nor do I understand enough about the geometric principles behind the ceiling designs. Is it essential to understand these more technical aspects to see where carpentry traditions might relate to each other? And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Anna. Thanks, Mariam. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. OK, so what we know about carpentry practices and particularly the work of those specialised in Carpinteria de lo Blanco in medieval Spain, comes largely from the later guild documents and manuals. Ordinances from the newly codified guilds in 16th century Seville and Granada classify the different carpenters according to type and status. There were carpenters of agricultural implements, those who made altarpieces and religious sculpture, 
those who made musical instruments, and those who specialized in Carpinteria de lo Blanco, among whom there were joiners, interlace carpenters, and geometricians. If you could go move the next slide. Yeah, thanks, Marin. Those of the highest status among the Carpinteria de, de lo Blanco carpenters were those who were capable of constructing the most complex interlaced ceilings. The documents describe how they had to pass an exam, which included being able to make the media naranja, or half orange ceiling, the term alluding not only to its hemispherical form, but also its segmented design, which required working with curved wood and complex geometry. And the image you see is of Teruel Cathedral. The previous image was of painters and carpenters in Teruel Cathedral, um, just generally working in specialized, uh, working with carpentry on the ground. But the next image is of the, the uh, media naranja ceiling, this special type of ceiling. And this is one of the Torrijo ceilings. Such was the importance of geometry that the carpenter who passed the exam to prove he could make this, these kinds of ceilings was known as el geometro, or the geometer. The four Torrijo ceilings are all different, but they include one of these highly complex media naranja ceilings now in the Archaeological Museum in Madrid. As a result of this complexity, surviving examples are very rare and the Torrijos dome is one of only six to survive. The role of geometry in making and the requirement for a master builder, a carpenter, to be skilled in applied geometry is something that's written about at length in a variety of medieval sources. The 14th century Maghrebi historian Ibn Khaldun wrote that, quote, carpentry needs a good deal of geometry of all kinds. It requires either a general or a specialized knowledge of proportion and measurement in order to bring the forms of things from potentiality into actuality in the proper manner. And for the knowledge of proportions, one must have recourse to the geometrician, end quote. Gulru Nechipolyu has examined Islamic treatises on applied geometry in her book on the top copy scroll. Many of these treatises sought to use geometry to solve problems that might be encountered by artisans, emphasizing the need for an applied knowledge of science. The writings of 10th century Abbasid philosopher Al-Farabi included examples of the application of geometry to carpentry. In his treatise on what is needed by the craftsman from geometrical construction, the per Persian mathematician Abul Wafa Buzjani uh, from the 10th century examined the application of geometry to architectural construction, such as tiled hemispherical domes. A copy of the Buzjani construction manual dated 1203 survives in Cairo, this time with a title that includes the tools needed by the carpenter, entitled Book of Joinery on Constructions with Ruler, Compass and Set Square. We're interested in the relationship then between these treatises and the applied work of aladifes or master builders as they're known in medieval carpentry. How were they used and to what extent do they describe existing practices? In the Spanish context, a carpentry manual composed in the early 17th century provides a key text for understanding how applied geometry was used in Carpinteria de Lía de lo Blanco. The author was Diego López de Arenas, an architect and master builder who worked in Seville. His carpentry manual, the Brief Compendium of White Carpentry and Treaties on Master Builders, was first published in 1633. Drawing from this long intellectual tradition of writing about geometry and craft in the Islamic world, it was probably condensed from a longer manuscript by the author written in 1619. In it, López de Arenas underscores the importance of a knowledge of practical applied geometry to making complex wooden ceilings. And he notes that, quote, the royal regulations of the Kingdom of Seville oblige the master builder to be an expert in geometry. It includes highly specialized technical details and drawings. It also uses specialized terms derived from the Arabic, which are still in use today among carpentry specialists. For example, the phrase limas muamares, a technical term for the beams that sit at angles to the ceilings, comes from the Andalusi Arabic term muammar, meaning trimmed or edged. It's interesting to consider how the persistence of these technical terms that derive from Arabic might point to a wider inheritance of carpentry techniques, decorative styles and functions from Islamic contexts. Just like al Buzjani's 10th century book of joinery on constructions with ruler, compass and set square, López de Arenas describes the tools used by the master carpenter in the making of ceilings, like those at Torrijos, as the ruler, compass, and cartabón. 
The cartabon is the triangular template made of wood that's similar to the roofer's square, the Stanley square used by carpenters today. A set of six cartabones, each fixed at a different angle, were used to measure all the angles used in the design and construction in a ceiling of a ceiling like, the, like those in Torrijos. They allow the carpenter to measure the pitch of the ceiling, the angles of the structural beams, and to construct ge the geometric designs and all the shapes needed for its hundreds of parts. And it's this tool, the set square or cartabon, that Enrique Nuere suggests was not familiar to the early medieval carpenters of North Africa, but which, as the Albuzjani treatise clearly states, was in widespread use, at least according to the texts, in Baghdad by the 10th century. While some work has been done on the Lopez Gardenas manual, including by Enrique Nuere and by Gulrina Cipolliu, we're yet to understand how the practices it describes relate to the wider carpentry practices in, in Islamic contexts. Were similar sets of cartabones, these set squares, used to make, for example, the, the Mamluk minbars? Were the divisions of labour and the status of carpenters according to their specialisms, as set out by Lopez Arenas, common to carpenters across North Africa, for example? We're keen to hear about descriptions of medieval working practices of carpenters in Islamic contexts, to find out how they might relate to those apparently consistently used in Al-Andalus until the 17th century. One reason why architectural wood has often been ignored by scholarship might be its frequent characterization as a cheap material. Wood and plaster with brick construction were the dominant materials used in North African and Andalusia architecture after the 12th century. These materials, wood, plaster and brick, have tended to be framed in the literature as inherently inferior to materials like marble and stone, which perhaps because they were more difficult to carve and transport, and were also features of a European classical architectural tradition, were considered more prestigious and worthy of attention than wood, plaster and brick within the art historical scholarship. This question of value is one that's crucial to our understanding of these ceilings and of decorative carpentry more widely. Value can be found in the hours of highly skilled labour attached to making these ceilings, as well as painting, gilding and mounting them. The design, carving, gilding and painting of wood in a strapwork ceiling raised its value far beyond that of a plain wooden ceiling. While we don't know what was originally paid for the four ceilings in Torrijos, we can get some idea of their cost by reference to contemporary descriptions of other ceilings. Our collaborator in this project, Maria Teresa Chicote, has explored this in her research, revealing that in his 14th century encyclopedia, Locrestia, Catalan author Francesca Eschimine described how a gilded wooden ceiling was more expensive than a stone ceiling. Value can also be measured in the reuse and movement of decorative wooden features. Reuse is, of course, a well-known practice. The Kaaba was famously built in 608 from beams reused from a shipwreck. Reused wooden panels can be found in the earliest of contexts. Lopez Pertiniet, who's written a lot about Nasrid carpentry, discusses the wooden doors of the monastery of Las Huelgas in Burgos, which, as suggested previously, were reused elements from an earlier wooden minbar, possibly from the Almohad period. Much later, our collaborator, Maria Teresa Chicote, has shown how the relocation of ceilings in the Castilian 16th century context was not unusual. She has descriptions of translocated wooden ceilings like that brought from Toledo to the Palacio de la Infantada in Guadalajara, where it was viewed by Emperor Charles V in the 1520s. So these are entire, entire ceilings that were moved from place to place. It's possible that the Viena y Torrijos ceiling was made for a different room or even different palace, and then later moved to the Torrijos palace. So the examination of the ceiling by the conservator at the Viena, Victor Borges, has shown how originally panels of the ceilings that would have linked seamlessly with the next, and you can see that here in the, in the image on the right, are now interrupted by lines of gilded moulding that outline eight sections of the ceiling. It seems that these mouldings were added to hide losses of the ceiling at a point where the ceiling was, uh, the sections were joined, which suggest that the ceiling was re-erected. But these mouldings date from very shortly after the, build, the ceiling was originally built. So it, it raises the possibility that this ceiling was moved from one place to another very soon after it was originally made. This salvage and relocation indicates the inherent value and status of this ceiling. And of course, we know from the large scale movement of Spanish ceilings in the 19th and early 20th centuries of wooden ceilings, 
that dismantling and re-erecting the ceilings multiple times was both possible, both possible and considered worth the time and expense. There's also value in the raw material of wood itself, which was highly prized and its sale restricted and regulated by the 16th century. It's likely that the flourishing of monumental wooden ceilings and furniture in the 12th to 16th centuries reflects an abundance of wood of high quality and high value in Al-Andalus. Al but by the time the Torrijos ceiling was made, this supply was likely less reliable. We know, for example, that in the city guilds documents of carpenters for Seville and Granada from the 16th century, permission to trade in wood was restricted to designated members of the carpenters guild. The kinds of ceilings we've been studying from the Alhambra cupola to the Torrijos ceilings are made using mostly smaller pieces of wood that are fitted together and constructed in panels. I think you can see that quite well here on this reverse view of one of the Torrijos ceilings, the one that's in Madrid. And these sit on then on a structure of larger supporting beams. The throne hall, as we've said in the Alhambra is made of over 8,000 individually carved pieces of wood. And while we haven't counted those in the Torrijos, they must number in their thousands. This of course allows for greater stress flexibility for the natural expansion and contraction of wood. But it also enables carpenters to specialize and use particular wood species for particular parts according to the requirements for carving, weight bearing or decorative clarity. We know a little about the kinds of woods that were prized in Nasrid constructions from work done by specialists like uh, uh, Lopez Pertiniet and Eduardo Trabajo. Analysis of the Alhambra cupola seen here on the right from the early 14th century showed that many different types of wood were used in individual ceilings. Atlas cedar was made, used for the carved polygons and inscription frieze. Mediterranean pine for the mucarnas, maple for the pine cone motifs, and poplar for the undecorated framing elements, and fir for the support sections. This was probably common practice. Tests on the Cuarto Real de Santo Domingo, the 13th century Nasrid Palace Maria mentioned earlier, found four different wood types, Mediterranean pine, maritime pine, Portuguese oak, and Atlas cedar. Mostly the woods were sourced from the local region. Um, uh, and many of them were native to the area around Morocco, around, sorry, around Granada, but cedar was probably imported from Morocco. It was prized as a lightweight, robust and durable wood that resists decay and can hold finely carved detail. It was used in the inlaid wooden minbars made for the Qutbiyya Mosque in Marrakesh in the 12th century, for the Sidi Bal Hassan Mosque, for example, in Tlemcen from 1296, as well as the Throne Hall of Comares from 1350. And we can see it in many examples from the 13th and early 14th centuries. But its use, the use of cedar dramatically declined after the mid 14th century. It was not found among 81 samples analyzed by Lopez Petiniez from the Alhambra, dating from the period after 1360. Analysis of wood types has not yet been carried out on the V&A ceiling, but samples of wood from the Torrijos ceiling that's in the Legion of Honor in San Francisco were analyzed by the a lab in California in the 1980s and identified as pine and some walnut. The lack of cedar in the Alhambra from the late 14th century may be related to a wider decline in supply of cedar from the forests of North Africa. Atlas cedar is an endemic species from Northwest African mountains. Environmental studies by Daniel Abelshad and colleagues from Granada University, among others, have documented the decline of the population in the Western Reef driven by a combination of climate change and human activity. They note that the use of cedar for Almohad building projects in North Africa and in Al-Andalus likely contributed to a sharp decrease in the Atlas cedar forests in the reef, evident in the data from the period. This environmental impact of the use of wood in monumental constructions in the medieval period is one aspect that we're interested in thinking about in a broader project on wood. Did an overuse and subsequent decline in the availability of particular wood types lead to changes in building practices? How were particular wood types valued, sourced and used? Cedar seems to have been replaced largely by high quality pine wood, as we see in later ceilings and doors in the Alhambra and other sites from the 14th century. Despite this decline in cedar, the large quantities of wood used in buildings in North Africa and Al-Andalus indicate this abundant supply of high quality wood in the medieval period. It suggests there were well-developed trading networks for a variety of types of wood in the region. Marcus Millwright again cites evidence that teak and tropical hardwoods, possibly from East Africa, were imported by sea 
to the ports of the Persian Gulf and shipped to Baghdad and Samarra in the Abbasid period. Wood identification analysis on the Samara beams in the VNA has confirmed that they were made from teak. Documentation then relating to wood trades mostly notes, however, the shipments of large quantities of wood rather than smaller quantities of specialized woods like cedar. Evidence from the shipbuilding industry, wood trade, survives in the archive of the Crown of Aragon, for example, documenting the 1344 arrival of a Nasrid boat in Almeria from the port of Badis in Morocco with a considerable load of wood, 320 fustes and 230 remos, which refer to different sizes. Leo Africanus, as the 15th century Andalusi diplomat Al Hassan Muhammad al Wazan was not known, noted in his autobiographical work how good wood for shipbuilding was available from the mountains around Badis, from where it was exported. There's also the considerable quantity of hidden wood necessary in the building projects of this period. Wood was used not only in the visible structures, the decorative ceilings and doors that we see today, but these decorative ceilings, like in the Alhambra, were covered with wo wooden roofing structures that protected and supported them. Wooden scaffold was required in large quantities to raise these prefabricated woods. The throne hall of the Comares Palace that you see on the left, one of the most monumental wooden ceilings at 11.3 by 18 meters off the ground, so it's 11 meters squared and 18 meters off the ground, would have required extensive scaffolding to erect, for example. Wood was also used in the making of the plaster molds that were made to make the plaster panels that cover the interior walls of medieval buildings at this time. So we would like to understand more about the contemporary value of wood and how it was sourced, traded and used in the wider medieval context. This brings us then to a question we've been asking about the relationship between these monumental ceiling constructions and other carpentry elements of the period, like doors, minbars, cabinets, chairs and tables. And this is really my final section here. Were these made in the same workshops by the same carpenters? We know that the most complex of ceilings, the media naranja, were overseen by the highest grade of carpenter, el geometro. But it seems likely that in fitting out an Almohad mosque or a Nasr palace, for example, the monumental wooden doors and ceilings, one of which you can see here from the Alhambra again, would have been part of the same job and completed in the same workshop. Wooden furniture primarily survives from the medieval period as mosque furniture, mihrabs, minbars, Quran stands, later freestanding furniture, cabinets, chests and chairs, and fixed architectural furniture, doors, windows, frames and screens. Decoratively, these seem to share many features with the geometric designs of the ceilings. Similar designs are found on doors and minbars from this period. The geometric designs of the ceilings, which are based on eight, 12 and 16 pointed stars, and use a combination of thafates and la lathos in their elements, are also found on wooden doors like these, this of the Sala de las Dos Hermanas of the Alhambra. These use the same system of interlocking dovetail joints as the ceilings. In her study of Nasr carpentry, López Pertiniez relates the designs of the doors to those of the ceilings, but she argues that the system of construction used on the doors is more complex than those of the ceilings, making their construction more sound and solid, and that's presumably to withstand the movement of the door and the strain it incurs from hanging on a hinge. She, she suggests that the technique used in doors predates the Nasr period, that understanding the construction of monumental doors was crucial in the development of this carpentry technique and that their complex geometry necess necess necessitated the work of specialized geometers capable of working to this high level. Minbars, particularly the movable Almohad minbars that we saw before, would presumably require the same level of solidity in construction as the doors. In his paper on the retractable Maxura screen of the Kutubiya Mosque in Marrakesh that Mariam mentioned, Antonio Almagro quotes from a 14th century description of the movable Kutubiya minbar and the retractable wooden screen that will be raised for the entrance of the ruler. The master builder is named as Al-Hajj Yaish al-Malaki from Malaga, who's documented as having worked on the city of Gibraltar. Despite their use of fine inlay and a mix of materials, including metals, bone and ivory, the minbars, doors and other wooden interior architecture seems to draw from the same techniques and styles as the ceilings made in Torrijos hundreds of years later. Is there value in considering them together would be the question that I think I'm going to finish on. We have a, a short video to show you of this, um, the Kutubiya screen that Antonio Almagro uh, has uploaded uh, uh, as part of his 
the article published so we can share the link with that as well. Um, I think Mariam's going to set up the short video. It's just it's of the model of the Maxora screen um, in the Kutubiya mosque. Yeah, sorry, I'm just having difficulties finding it again now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bear with me. We'd really, yeah, we'd really like your comments on and feedback on all of this and things we've been thinking about, all these questions that we have. Can you see that? Yeah, that's perfect. So it shows the Maxura screens being raised by a system of ropes and pulleys that are actually hidden underneath the floor in front of the mihrab. And that's, these are wooden screens, these were wooden screens. And then the uh, portable minbar, wooden minbar. And these are, these are all from the extension of around 1163 of the Kutubiya Mosque, which could also be um, brought out and in, uh, hidden from view without uh, people pushing it. And I think we just thought this was a, a, a fascinating and quite fun video to end on. Uh, we don't we don't know where the screens are. I don't think the screens still exist at all, but there's some archaeological evidence for them. But they're described as being made from wood. So it'd yeah. be interesting to consider what they um, originally looked like. The so this part is the, of the model is um, based on what they've excavated. Um, so the, this is all based on understanding excavations from the, at the Kutubiya. We'll see a side angle in a second so you get a better sense of what the, the kind of mechanism is that's driving this. My cat's decided to join us. <laughs> it does have a uh, sound, this video, but it's all in Spanish, so it's probably easier not to. And the sound isn't great either. I've put the link in the chat so you can um, also find this on YouTube and watch it again if you like. Should we leave it there, Anna? Yes, I think so. I think so. Well, th thank you very much. That was really nice to end with that video. Extraordinary, extraordinary, yes. Um, thank you very much for this very interesting um, uh, lecture uh, on a very complex subject. Obviously, you've done so much work already, and there is a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, sort of uh, areas that uh, would be very interesting for you to continue to look into. Um, so please, uh, audience, write in the chat your points and your questions. And if I can sort of uh, start the conversation, I wanted to ask a bit more about the types of wood because um, uh, you, uh, Anna has talked about the, the types of wood, or wood uh, Pino Silvestre, Maria mentioned the, the, La Car Carpinteria de lo Blanco. And I'm wondering whether La Carpinteria de lo Blanco is a term that refers more generally to uh, wood um, fillings or, or it refers more generally to carpentry rather than to a specific type of wood, because as you mentioned, the types of wood were several. And of course, we know, I mean, if I remember correctly, the historian of Marrakushi, the, the you know, uh, a native of Marrakesh, who writes at the end of the 13th 
uh, beginning of the 14th century, he lists the woods that were used for the mimbar in the Cordova mosque, which is now lost. And he, you know, he mentions red and yellow sandalwood and uh, uh, ebony and even Indian wood. So, you know, with the assumption that wood obviously was traded, traded from uh, um, a number of areas, including very far away, which obviously has economic sourcing, economic and trading implications, which you refer to, Anna. So I think that, uh, I don't know whether you have any further idea on that, but uh, another point that derives from, from that is, um, is about the selection of woods. I mean, so, of course, the selection of, of the correct wood is just as important as the carving uh, process. So I wonder whether, you know, you have any insight about the selection of wood precisely for the purposes of, uh, of whatever, you know, carpentry you, you are studying. Yeah, so the, the question on Carpinteria de lo Blanco and the, and the naming of that, you know, we have the Lopez de Arenas, which is 17th century, which talks about Carpinteria de lo Blanco. And at that time, they were using pine largely. So we, the Torrijo ceilings are, are mostly pine and, you know, of that type. So I think, you know, that, 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 that phrase, Carpinteria de lo Blanco, refers to this type of carpentry. Um, but it doesn't, you know, we don't know what it was called earlier on, essentially. We don't know what it was called in the 12th century. Mm -hmm. um, the selection of woods is really important. I mean, that you know, that description of the types of woods used in the minbar and, you know, the, the evidence from the, the minbars and from doors and from, you know, piece, more piece, uh, furniture that uses smaller pieces of wood. Shows they were able to source lots of little pieces of ebony, for example, and bone and ivory and mix it all. But for the ceilings, which needed larger pieces, we have mainly this, the woods that I was talking, that I mentioned, you know, I mean, cedar early on, and then this use of overwhelming use of different types of pine. But, it, you know, what I found interesting looking at the Alhambra cupola wood types, which we know a little bit more about the five different woods, is that they very much chose, you know, exactly what you say, the carpenters know which type of wood to use for which part of the ceiling, which part of the construction. So poplar is a lighter kind of wood, it's less dense, and that's used, you know, very much for the, the uh, construction behind, so for the supporting elements. And cedar is used for where you want to have certain, you know, sharpness of detail, for example. So, yeah, I mean, we need to know, that's a, something that we'd love to know more about. How much did they specialise in that way? And mm -hmm. what were those properties? It's important, yeah. Some of the properties are about repelling insects, aren't they, Anna, as well? I mean, you know more about this than I do, but... Um, choosing things like cedar to make your ceilings out of they're kind of naturally insect repellent so then they have contributed to these ceilings surviving across the centuries as well yeah yeah thank you very much let's see if there is anything in the chat please write in the chat um uh, that is amazing thank you for sharing the the uh, sarah chowdhury the the, <laughs> the video Okay, while we're waiting, um, I, I was thinking of um, another um, area that I, I would very much like to know more about. Uh, and that is, you know, this, um, this, it's not really a distinction, it's a combination of tangible and intangible heritage. So, you know, you've done a lot of work on the physical reality, the techniques, the styles, and and I wonder whether you will also go into the um, the meaning surrounding these works, not just in terms of social context of where they were used and what kind of uh, symbology they could have been within the space and you know the symbology given to the space, but also in terms of um, whether the woods themselves had a property that was symbolic, like it happens in many other cultures. Yeah, I don't think that's something that that last point you made is not something that we've particularly thought about. But I mean, in Torrijos, like Anna was discussing that the sort of, it's more to do with the with the polychromy and the gilding of them that makes them such expensive 
ceilings and then and then it becomes about kind of showing off your your wealth and your patronage power um especially to be able to commission the top quality artisans to make a the hemispherical type of ceiling um and in terms of I mean, going back to Torrijos, there's lots of other devices that are used in those ceilings that relate to the to the patrons specifically. So there's not just the ceiling with the sort of eight pointed stars and the geometric decoration, but then other many other elements incorporated. So they, they're very they're sort of speaking about the patrons yeah. of the palace mm -hmm. in that case. But yeah. um, yes, I mean, that's definitely something that we need to be thinking mm -hmm. about as well. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, something in the chat, Francisco Mamani, thank you very much for this um, presentation, bravo, I have a question, maybe I didn't understand it very well, you don't agree with the hypothesis that there were only Christian carpenters behind the construction of the ceiling in Al-Andalus? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, An Anna, do you want to say more about it? Well, yeah, because no, you've no. looked at the 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 craftsman a bit more yeah so there's you know there's we don't really know who you know we don't know the religion of the people who made the ceilings you know they don't they're not explicitly said we do know that they're you know in the by the 16th century there are different carpenters were drawn from different religious denominations but i think we're we're interested in as well in in where those techniques you know geographically where those these techniques and styles might have come from and you know whether they were drawn, we think from North African area, you know, from that from the Islamic context. Um, and they, but the do not the religious affiliation of the carpenters, we don't know. You know, we don't know, but we would definitely wouldn't agree that uh, they were only Christian carpenters because there's no evidence for that. Yeah, I suppose there's an argument that some of them might have been carpenters working in Castile, but we're not, you know going to make you know pass judgment on what religion they had but I think you know the Noeri's hypothesis is is that this is an indigenous um Hispanic tradition and that there is no you know it doesn't come it's not you know what as people have thought before that it was um that's something that developed and not I mean it's not that it came into Al-Andalus with the with the conquest in the 8th century I mean it seems like it from from all the evidence at the moment it seems like something that developed in North Africa in the 12th century and that you know then there's a merging of of technologies and aesthetics on the Iberian Peninsula so it could have met an indigenous Hispanic carpentry tradition but that's not to say that it was not also um there was not also a, a, an islamic tradition of it if that makes sense and i think you've um demonstrated quite well the you know the spread the widespread um um technical skills of carpentry uh, in a vast area of the islamic world and we could have gone much further but obviously yeah. in the interests of, of time <laughs> but um yeah uh, adam nadim it's amazing that this type of ceiling traveled to latin america however it never came to egypt since it was a one-way transition uh what do you mean by a one-way transition well just um i'm just wondering what he it was, it was yeah so it was um yeah, I mean, it came to Latin America as a result of, you know, the Spanish conquests and in the New World. Um, so that it's it's quite a kind of logical transition in that case. Um, there are, I mean, you you'd know better than me, Adham, that you know there are examples of of wooden ceilings in Egypt that we'd like to understand better. Actually, I wanted to ask you about that as well. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe maybe he'd be able to shed some. I mean, you know, we there, we're aware that there are these other many other things that we you know we haven't had the time yet to kind of do all this research, and we're hoping yeah. you know we're not necessarily the ones to do it either. You know that it would just be wonderful to have a kind of big collaborative project that brings together think, all, all these <laughs> all, all you specialisms. Said, including the technical issues exactly. that I mentioned at the end, the call for an interdisciplinary project. Absolutely, yes. And, you know, and all, all the different regions. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. 
Tom Nixon, thanks for a fabulous talk. It's really wonderful how far you've been able to take this project. You touched briefly on overlaps between wooden and plaster mucarna ceilings. The media naranja ceilings also have parallels in stone terracotta in the dome of the chapel of San Jeronimo in Toledo. Have you seen much evidence for exchange of skills between workers in different media? Do you imagine your project will focus principally on wood alone? That's um, that's a great question, Tom. We had a, a, a fantastic visit to that chapel in Toledo, um, which is this media naranja. It's an imitation media naranja wooden ceiling uh, uh, cupola made of what we think is terracotta and then uh, glazed and luster painted tiles imitating wood. And it's the terracotta is left to look as if it's wood. It's made in the 15th century probably by a merchant from Manises as far, or from Valencia, as far as I remember. Um, and that overlap is, is really evident and really important, I think, for a study of ceilings. This, because they, you know, plaster mucarnas and plaster itself always seems to occur alongside wooden ceilings, whether that's in the walls or in mucarnas leading up to it, or in complementary ceilings, as you saw in the Kutubiya mosque. So, yeah, we think that's really important. Um, we haven't gone that far yet on the on the on the project at all. I think we are thinking about wood in particular in this project, focusing on wood. Um, and at least that's the area that we think is is uh, we're working on now. But I think exchange of skills, we haven't seen that much evidence for, but haven't really been looking out for it. Um, what you find, I think, are, you know, you get these mukarna ceilings in plaster complemented by these wooden painted and decorated and carved ceilings. So they're not the same imitating each other, um, but I think definitely they would have worked alongside each other in the same buildings, in the same structures. Thank you, uh, Claire Anderson. Thank you for both. Thank you both for a great presentation. Has the engineering treatise of Almuradi useful at all for your thinking about the applied geometry and craftsman knowledge? I've never heard of the um, engineering treatise of Almoradi, so please tell us more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claire. That will be on our reading list. <laughs> yes. I mean, I should emphasise that we've just pulled together things that we've been thinking about. Um, mm. And this is, you know, this isn't necessarily even the beginning of a. It's just, you know, we yeah. want your feedback now <laughs> for where to go. Uh, I would like to ask a question. It is, also, is it also common for artisans to use nails to fix the smaller wooden panels when creating wooden furnitures? For members of wooden doors, is it more often to use nails to fix the small wooden panels? So on the doors, in yeah, and the doors don't, then the Alhambra doors don't have nails. So they use a particular, because, you know, the ceilings tend to have nails because of gravity, you know, to avoid them falling off where they would with the especially changes in temperature. But the doors, and I, you know, as far as I know, all the min bars don't originally have nails. I think when you look at them now in images, often the there are nails, but they're put in later and they're very visible, these big nails that are put in later. But we yeah. do have decorative nails. So yeah. we went to, um, when we were in Toledo in October, we went to the, the convent of Santa Isabel, which I showed a picture of the ceiling. We were taken inside the refectory where there's this amazing, I mean, we didn't really have time to bring it into the talk today, but there's a door. There are other doors as well, which I think look a bit more like the um, Dos Hermanas doors from the Alhambra, but there are, in this case, it was a it was a mashrabia door, um, which may be from the it's fifteenth century the foundation of that convent, um, and that's got decorative nails on it. So part of the sort of it's it's got mashrabia, it's got carving, it's got in, inlay in different resins, and it's got these decorative nails. So I think it kind of depends on the technique that's being used on a particular object. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mina Okato, thank you for the talk. Extremely beautiful. Are there any other architectural features in the Torrijos site which appropriated from neighboring of faraway cultures? 
If it's a matter of getting exotic feature as a one off, probably more interested in contracting foreign craftsmen, if they're interested in building a cosmopolitan culture, then more interested in training local craftsmen. Craftsmen obviously do prefer to work with woods they know. So the Torrijos site uh, doesn't exist anymore, but um, we have you know, good documentation that we've been able to piece together. So we've got some photographic documentation and we know where other, and, and uh, drawn engravings from the 19th century and a good plan. And we've got um, other examples of plaster and stone elements that have been removed from the palace and are now in different nearby locations. Um, and it all conforms very much to a very sort of what was becoming a standardized vocabulary for noble Castilian palace construction in the 14th and 15th centuries. And we think there's, there's a, a good argument that can be made that the architects who are working on buildings for the Catholic monarchs in Toledo at a more or less contemporary period were also working on the Torrijos Palace. So it's not so much about, um, you know, what's the word that you used? Appropriating um, faraway cultures. It's, you know, already this style of ceiling was a Castilian ceiling. Um, I think probably uh, um, Mineo meant building a cosmopolitan culture. So mm. were there um, the craftsmen that came from abroad? Not that we have any evidence for. In the case in the case of Torrijos, they were local. I mean, the architects that we know about who mm. are working for the Catholic monarchs are are local, or they come well. They come from Flanders. You know, they they're coming from northern mm. Europe. We have that doc that in the archives of the Alhambra, they refer to a, ma a master from Torrijos. In fact, so mm. we kind of there's probably also people working there from who came yeah. from Torrijos as well. Thank you. Uh, Blair Winter, does your research shed light on the construction of the domes in the mosque in Cordova? They are considered quite innovative and I wonder if your research shows a continuity going back in time. We haven't looked at those in, in this project. They're stone and 10th century, so we're not thinking about those at the moment. Okay. Uh, Rose Walker, a brilliant session, thank you. Have you looked at the carved beams and corbels in San Milan in Segovia, early mm. century? A stage on from the plain painted beams. I'm not sure they help you, but have always thought that their forms and motifs relate to Andalusian examples, even if in some cases already used in the north. Thank you. We'll have a look at that. Yeah. Hamza Vargas, a fascinating presentation. My question is about the geometric patterns. Is there a tradition of interpreting the patterns used? Any spiritual meaning behind the use of an eightfold or twelvefold rosette? Not that, not that's been you know that we are you know definitely aware of. When you when you remember the poem that we quoted from the Alhambra earlier, it's it was in the the marvels of the making of this carpentry and the, of the, the ceramics and the plaster work. And it was in, that was that the poet really, you know, talks about that. So not about a spiritual meaning behind them. I know some people would argue that, that they can, that that is, that there is some kind of sacred geometry behind them. But in the documentation that we've read about them or descriptions of them or poems about these um, ceilings, we haven't found, or the geometry, we haven't found that. Mariam, do you? I mean, not that we, I mean, I think any interpretation that we put on that would be our own interpretation. I mean, I'd like to read something that was is from the period about that kind of interpretation, but I haven't, I'm not aware of anything that talks about that kind of symbolism. The example, you know, the, the only example that sort of talks about its own um, symbolism is the is the Comare ceiling isn't it where the inscriptions refer to you know that they, they seem to refer to that ceiling as as representing the the sort of seven heavens right 
Thank you very much. Anissa Foucault, concerning the carpentry workshops, might it be possible that there were different specialities in every workshop? It's yeah. possible. <laughs> we don't, there's just so little information about the workshops. No, enough about workshops. Um, yeah, I mean, what do the guilds, there's there, there are multiple specialisms in the sort of guild regulations, aren't there? Yeah, there's four or five specialisms in the guild of Granada and Seville that I've read. And, and I think, uh, you know, that probably reflects the specialisms that there were, you know, going back as well, but, you know, before the 16th century. So that specialisms of carpenters, now workshops physically, we don't know, you know, whether they worked alongside each other or not. You kind of have to imagine some kind of collaboration between the people who painted and decorated the ceilings and those who made the structure of the ceilings. Sure. Yeah. Um, referring to previous, uh, Adam says you have corbelled ceilings from Egypt. And okay. then also referring to a previous uh, question, Al Muradi, circa 13th century, earliest Andalusi engineering treaties, I'll send you the details. Um, <laughs> Sarah Chowdhury, many thanks, Mary and Anna, for this interesting talk. Just some thoughts regarding the patterns and whether they could be regional. In some cases, this is true, as some patterns have been used much more extensively in some parts of the Islamic world than others. Based on my observations in the Iberian Peninsula, the rosette motif in eight and 16 point form features extensively. But what I found further interesting is that there is less adherence to geometric construction rules and tiling than would be seen in more advanced Islamic artistic practice. The Alhambra is one of the most advanced though. This lack is most notably in the ceiling that are attributed to the Mudeja sites. There could be several reasons for this, but two aspects I would suggest could be that in trying to comply with structural aspects using established tradition for constructing vaulted ceilings, perhaps, a compromise was made in the quality of the geometry. Secondly, it's a very advanced ge geometer that would need to be consulted to design geometry that could work in a 3D form. This therefore brings more questions to the light regarding those exams that geometers were required to do. I'd be very <laughs> pleased to see more of those. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's really, I mean, that's really helpful to, to think about. Um, as you know, the geometry is one aspect of these that I feel like I need to understand more. Um, but I don't think we know anything about the exams, do we, Anna? That we just know that they have to pass through these different levels of qualification in order to reach the level of master craftsman, master carpenter. And then there's one thing, you know, drawing out these designs on a flat page, but it's absolutely another thing as, as you know, people will know, creating them in 3D and cutting the, you know, uh, drawing and cutting the angles on the wood in, for a 3D structure. And maybe that's why there are only six of these Mediana Naranja ceilings left, you know, or, or survive that we have. Um, and they're, they're extraordinary geometrical constructions, incredible. There's an article by Noere and um, two other colleagues about the, the Media Naranja ceiling from Torrijos, which is in Madrid, because unusually in that case, you can view it from behind, the, you know, the sort of reverse that we showed a picture of. Um, and so they've tried to reconstruct the kind of method and the geometrical approach to making that ceiling. And they, they do say, if I understand it correctly, that there's a, a point where the geometry has to be slightly fudged in order to get it to fit into the into the hemispherical form. So it's, I think it's you know there's principles, but then there's how that's applied in practice when the, when the ceiling's being built. Um, Olga Bush, thank you, Anna and Mariam, for the great presentation of your far-reaching project. I wonder if the numerous artesonado ceilings in the churches of Granada together with the 16th century carpenters' manuals, can contribute further to the construction and types of wood? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of ceilings, artisanata ceilings across the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and in terms of types of wood, I guess, you know, somebody has to agree for that analysis to happen. 
Yeah. I mean, in the Alhambra, they've done a lot of analysis of the wood because they've been doing such ex extensive conservation projects on, you know, on the building over the last few decades. But I, I wonder whether that's a kind of normal process if, if a church is going to be conserved, whether it would be habitual to take a sample for wood identification, which I imagine is not the case. That would be nice. But yeah. Thank you. Anderson says that Al Muradi actually is slightly 11th century, but surviving copies 13th century. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> Tom Nixon also relating to the question, the connections between wood and um, ceilings made of different materials says Ibn Marsuk also describes a complex ceiling that he says looks like wood, but are in fact made in plaster and brick. That's amazing. I'd love to hear more about that, Tom. And Ariel Fein, uh, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. You're raising such important questions. I look forward to hearing how this research develops. I agree that there is a useful connection with the Sicilian material, both in the extant ceilings and in architectural furnishings. You might consider looking at the documentation of the 12th, 13th century Messina cathedral ceiling, which although it does not survive, there are some extant fragmentary panels and documentation of its medieval appearance and construction. Would you consider uh, any of the Frechia material, like much of the Egyptian material, uh, the construction techniques are different, but may still be fruitful? Yes, of course. Yes, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm wondering if Ariel is able to clarify the date of the Chafalu ceiling. I'm putting her on the spot now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Meantime, yeah. Uh, Glare Anderson, do you know uh, Alpayo Zudural work? He has discussed how mathematicians ta taught artisans the geometry from the 10th century in the Eastern context. I would imagine a similar approach pertained to Al Andalus. No, don't know it. He's it actually has been he's been really helpful. I've been reading okay. him trying to understand what the geometers were up to. So yeah, thank you. It's, I think it does apply definitely in Al Andalus. Great, thank you very much. Yes. Um, can I have one final question? And then I promise we close because you must be absolutely... <laughs> <laughs> my, my final question is about whether any of these ceilings are modular structures in the sense that they could be done in pieces on the floor, constructed yep. and then... All of them, you know. That, that's how they're constructed. Yeah. Because the media naranja um, image, beautiful image that you showed, uh, the the uh, the the outside of the inside, you know, yeah. the other the other view, yeah. um, it looks like a, a unicum, a unicum in that it doesn't look made of uh, pieces, you know, in a modular form. I think some of that has to do with later restorations, right? Okay. Um, bits that have fallen out of the ceiling and then have been replaced. Um, I mean, we know in the v &A ceiling from Torrijos that there are quite, uh, there seem to have been interventions into it at different times that, you know, we can't necessarily date, but, and also from some of the pictures of the palace just before it was dismantled, that they were not necessarily in a good condition. So I think some of that so they were all modular ceilings, okay. um, but where, you know, in that rare case where we can see the reverse, it, that's maybe slightly disguised by the fact that it's now, in a, you know, it's a permanent installation in a museum and it's oh. been restored. So it's got these, um, you know, patches, so, basically. It's a patchwork. Yeah, thank you. Ariel says, oh, I great. Okay. in the early uh, 1130s is most accurate, but see Ruggiero Longo's 2022 article on the construction of the cathedral. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Anna and Mariam, for this very interesting session and for answering all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure we necessarily answered them, no, but no, thank no, you, no. everybody, for all the comments and and if you do uh, have further thoughts, please get in touch with us because we'd love sure, to keep sure. talking about this subject. So we're giving you a virtual applause and thank you very much again and uh, have a good thank evening. You. Thank you very much. Good luck for the proceeding. Well, I'm sure you'll know, you'll, you'll all hear what... <laughs>
and there are lots what of what things we start thinking about in, next. in the in the chat thanks everybody okay thank you <laughs> bye bye bye, -bye.